So how might we be that fragrance of Christ among these two different groups? That's what Paul goes on to write in verse 16. For to the one we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. Now, we'll stop verse 16 there. The, the second way Paul describes this parade fragrance is that he shows we're either the aroma of death or life. Let's break it down. First is the aroma of death leading to death. That seems rather macabre, dreary. How might we be the aroma of death leading to death? You know, the, the idea of the gospel uh, making us the aroma of life leading to life, that makes more sense. It sounds better to our ears. It sounds a little bit happier. But why death? Because as born-again believers in Jesus Christ, we are ourselves reminders to the rest of the world of the inevitable result of sin. As Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That we hold fast to the gospel of Jesus, that we hold fast to the scriptures, is a glaring reminder to the world that there is such a thing called sin, and it does lead unto death. And generally speak, speaking, this is a message the world does not like. In fact, the world hates it. My bride received a taste of that this week as she painted the mural that's outside on our windows, hearing angry shouts from people as they're driving by. Why all the hate? Hate, of course, being an ironic response from those who claim to be the most tolerant. <laughs> Why the idea of hate? Because they hate the idea of sin. They, cannot set a, they can't be told that they are not allowed to set their own standard and that they cannot decide their own morality. That's galling to them. It, it is offensive that there is such a thing as objective truth. An objective right and wrong, and this standard is revealed to us in the pages of the Bible. And this is the very thing that people, some people I should say, in our city are currently protesting. They hate that the Bible clearly labels some of their preferences as perversion. They rebel against the standards of the scripture taking pride in what the Bible calls sin. And to consider that there are eternal consequences for sinning against Almighty God, that is unthinkable to them. And that's why they rail against the gospel as though it's hate speech. They hate the gospel because the gospel tells them that the perversions they love, God hates. And this is why we are to them the aroma of death leading to death. For those who persist in the rejection of God, we are not but the stench of death. And their nostrils, we carry a reminder of their own inevitable death, and that's why they want nothing to do with us. Now question, what should the response of Christians be to this? Knowing that we are hated by the world, being inherently offensive to them, what should we do? First, yes, we are offensive, and this is something that will remain unchanged because Jesus himself is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, 1 Peter 2.8. But we ought to not go out of our way to become even more offensive. Let their offense be taken at the truth of Christ, not at the obnoxiousness of some Christians. We need to be careful not to get baited into conflict, not to be provoked into arguments. Moreover, we need to know when to speak, when, when to step aside, just brushing the dust off our feet. Remember that Jesus told his disciples not to cast pearls before swine, Matthew 7, verse 6, meaning that we're not to give the gospel to people who are plainly unwilling to listen. When they show themselves unwilling, just stop. We are never going to argue or debate anyone into the kingdom of God. So our interaction with those who are in our rebellious culture needs to be soaked in biblical wisdom and patience and love. Now in this, we never back down from the truth. We stand firm in the gospel promises of Christ. We stand fast on the scripture itself, never compromising on the truth of God. In a different historical context with a different opposition, the reformer, Martin Luther, also stood against the loudest voices in his culture. When the Pope and other Roman Catholics demanded that Luther recant his view of the gospel, along with recanting Luther's condemnation of papal sin and other false teachings of Catholicism, he stood his ground reportedly saying, Here I stand, I can do no other. 
when our culture attempts to browbeat you into agreeing with them that sexual perversion is not sin, or that racist philosophies are not racist, or that the Bible does not teach an exclusive gospel, but it is instead a book filled with oppression and sexism and racism and intolerance and all the rest, do not give in. Do not back down one inch. When presented with lies, do not water down the truth. Now, you need not shout. Do not get angry, you need not get violent, which accomplishes nothing but destroying your own credibility. Instead, pray to God, calmly state, here I stand, I can do no other. Then like Luther and others who've gone before us, you continue to preach and represent Jesus to the world.